My name is Ryan Radcliffe, and I lead product marketing at Support Logic. Support Logic was really founded on the fact that support signals and the things happening in support cases are beneficial to the whole company. Uh, but you can't have your whole company combing through cases. You've got to have the a way to surface the most important things happening in those cases. The churn risk, negative sentiment is something we talk about a lot. Um, which cases are likely to escalate? What are the needles in the haystack? Where is the smoke happening before there's a fire? Um, it was really founded on those principles by Krishna Raja, our CEO. Um, and so this product takes AI and NLP machine learning, and we can predict and surface the things that matter most. And so support folks can use that to reduce their escalations, reduce their backlog, they can use our models to uh, assign the right agent to every case by using kind of a five factor model. You can kind of see where this is going with, you know, we can we can kind of add this layer of intelligence to what you're doing in support. So I want uh, to kick off by asking this, like the general open ended question I usually start with is, you know, if you want to share a story or two of, of challenges that you faced with that whole uh, positioning slash messaging uh, for the products that you've worked on in the past? Yeah. So um, we, so with this company, we have a, we have a product that is very well positioned with support managers and what, and we have a very clear narrative. Um, our marketing leadership comes from Zuora and a very healthy uh, background of how to craft a narrative and what that position is. Um, and as we launch new products, like for example, for, for support engineers, that's an area where in the last year or so, we've learned a lot from how we're positioning and messaging the product. Um, and I think a lot of that sometimes comes into what you aren't. So we originally launched this product and there was some go-to-market friction of who is this for? And when we backed up and we injected more of a marketing strategy to it, um, we really started with, what are three pain points that you're solving with this product? And then translate that into what are the three benefits? Uh, a framework I really like to use is Now You Can, which is a very popular framework. Um, if you can answer everything with Now You Can, if you can look at your messaging with So What and kind of uh, almost like the, um, I think the phrase is like, it's turtles all the way down. Uh, have you ever heard that? It's turtles oh. all the way down. You can think of it's a, it's so what all the way down. Just keep drilling your so what's. Um, like, the, not, like the why, 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 yeah. the five whys, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so one of my favorite parts of this was realizing that it's for a specific CRM. It's for a specific support engineer using a specific system. And it's okay to get specific. Um, and I think something that we talk about and we learn more and more is um, it's so important to disqualify as much as you're qualifying. Um, and I think it helps people clarify with positioning and messaging, like probably 90% of the people you talk to, I'm from the, the church of April Dunford um, and her book. I think that is a great place to start. Um, I think about the cake pop analogy all the time. Um you know, I think my favorite part of that is who it's speaking to. Um, I like to think of it as a dessert on a dessert. So it's cake on a pop. And that's really, I think, part of who you're speaking to. Um, and with something like this and this product that we're working on uh, for support engineers, it was back to those rules of three. And I think the rule of three is just very simple of these are the three pain points. These are the three things we're solving. This is the CRM that this works for well. And this is the CRM that it's not for, um, and really focusing that market. I I just love how when you said for you know being specific and disqualifying, and I think that's not to overgeneralize the challenges that come with products or uh, with with um, positioning messaging, but if you know if I were to think of what is the the, the kind of like meta challenge there, it's the willingness or unwillingness to focus, right? I mean, it's this, it's classic marketing 101 stuff, niching, focusing, targeting your market, ICP, all that stuff, right? But as somebody who looks at hundreds of B2B websites on a regular basis, 
I see so many examples of the opposite of that, of, you know, let's, we just mentioned CRMs. I think CRMs are a great example for this, for tech, right? There's so many CRMs out there. Some of them are more focused than others, but a lot of them are just like the CRM you need to whatever, like, you know, now you can whatever, but not even specific, right? And I wanted to drill down on that a little bit because I think there's a lot of um, layers to that kind of culture behind what allows you as a marketer to be that specific. So my first question to follow up with is, you know, you, you mentioned that, you know, you had to look at it from this marketing strategy position, right? And, and sometimes marketing kind of gets, can, can feel a little lost or not really having a seat at the table when it comes to the overall strategy. And I just want to see if you can share a little bit about like how that relates to the culture that you work with and leadership and, and how that all came about in like a functional day-to-day -day way. I think it starts with leadership. Um, my mentor, my boss, the CMO, he comes from a strong narrative background. We have a CEO who gets marketing. He was the company's first marketer. Uh, he's got a very great grasp at, at you know how long things take, at how important that message is, how that message has to be beyond him, how it has to be company-wide. Um, and so we start that narrative at the top. And then I really believe in that classic funnel um, that gets down to copy, where you start with a strategic narrative, you establish your point of view, then you're into positioning, messaging, and then the messaging informs the copy. Um, I've been tossing around a theory I want to throw at you uh, in the last couple of weeks, and um, I haven't put this on LinkedIn yet, but I, I like to think of it as the baseball diamond of go to market. Um, we are in the midst of going to market with a new integration right now. Um, the tool is now plugging into Gainsight um, and opening us up to a new, a new market of customer success. And so part of going to market is you've got these different parts of, of what you've got to do. And I kind of think of them as the, as the bases on a baseball diamond, you've got your initial sort of uh, test group where you're developing your product and you're you're getting that feedback and you're you're creating the thing that the market wants, right? And then you've got this other part of the baseball diamond where you are establishing partnerships, marketplaces, integrations, and then you've got a big piece where you are you know creating that PR and that AR relationship, and then you're creating content. You've got your webinars and your blogs, your SEO optimized content. So you can see kind of those baseball bases sort of happening around your GTM. Um, and then the part that I'm really thinking about is I think the baseball bat, the part that that makes it not just a, a hit or a home run, but a grand slam, the baseball bat is the positioning. I think that's where it all comes together. And you, that when you have the right hitter and the right bat, you load the bases with those things, and then it all it all happens. It just took sports analogies to a whole nother level with that. I love it. Um, no, that's great. And I, one thing that really popped out to me with with um, the first base being like you know the feedback, having that feedback loop, right? Mm -hmm. How important that is throughout the whole process, and. You know, you mentioning that the leadership in the company has this strong marketing background where it sounds like they're very involved in these customer conversations, right? Because again, we all know that it's very easy for marketers to get kind of caught behind the wall and and not really have that much inter interaction. And unless they have a very, very strong sales collaboration uh, culture, they can be kind of operating on like theoretical models of what we think, you know, people want and not really operating from deeply understanding the specific customers and not just generalizing. That's right. I think we're really lucky to have those relationships. And when I go to work for a, a company, I'm looking for those relationships because there's problems that you want to solve and there's values that you want to bring. Um, but when you're looking for the product that you want to support and the company that you want to work for, I think there's got to be some basic tenants there. I think there's got to be a good product I think there's got to be um, a customer that wants it. Um, so yeah, often, like you were saying, you you look at um, SaaS websites and you look at uh, different brands and you've got to have, there's got to be something there. You can't move the whole boulder up the mountain um, in product marketing. There's got to be a coalition. There's got to be uh, a culture there. 
Yeah, for sure. And I wanted to also jump back to one thing you were talking about with, you know, now you can blank, which I, I love that as a, as a, you know, just as, as a, as a way to trigger ideas, right. A way to, to be able to, fo- first of all, focus on you instead of us as you know, when you're saying now you can, you're by default, not saying why we're awesome. Yeah. Right. Because why we're awesome comes much later than now you can. But one of the challenges with that is, you know, when you're thinking about particularly a B2B and you're talking about there's the end user who now can whatever, and then there's the group that pays for it and approves it. Right. So it's almost like, and I don't want to assume this, but tell me if I'm off base, there's like these two layers of clients, right? Um, how have you approached that with with your messaging in the sense of being able to address both the end user that's going to get that wonderful benefit of the now I can do this and also be able to make that business case ROI, however it is that you, you kind of position that? With With messaging to these two different groups, I think something that's really important is having that message on your website, on your materials that can speak to them w- using different tools. Um, and something that we're really starting to explore is a jobs to be done framework um, for messaging. And part of what I love about it is I have a theory that the more technical an audience and the more technical a customer, the more a jobs to be done framework lines up, the more fluff that you can cut off um, and just say exactly what you're doing. So for example, with us, escalation prevention, escalation management. Instead of, you know, I'm going to get into a copy example, but instead of cut your escalations in half or um, stop the smoke before the fire, I think a technical audience wants to know exactly what are you doing? Tell me exactly what this is. Is this for me? Um, Cut to the chase. Um, And I think part of that is a maturity of, of a market and of a customer. Um, And an example I try, an analogy I try to make with this is um, sort of a classic cliche at this point where we talk about Apple and the iPod and the thousand songs in your pocket and that sort of fluffy messaging that came in first. But now with the iPhone, there we don't have that fluffy messaging. Now it's what's the capacity? What's the camera size? Give me the technical details because now we have an audience that's more mature. They know the product, they know the space. And so I think we spent a couple of years talking about what is customer sentiment. And now as competitors come into the market, as support professionals see how valuable AI is, how everyone's seeing how valuable AI is, we can kind of cut to the chase and talk about what exactly are you doing for me with these products? So I think that's what jobs to be done is really good at. I and and going back to the example to stop the smoke before the fire, which was just you know if you just pull that out as a copy example, um, as a as a copywriter, and I think about approaching a project, and you have you know whatever level of positioning slash messaging framework brief whatever that might have been done or might not have been done, right? Sometimes you have it really nicely put together in this beautiful kind of central point of truth and you can operate from that and then focus on the copy. Sometimes you really have to go back and start from the square one, right? Because they're just kind of like, we, we, we sell software to small businesses. Like, okay, we got a lot of work to do. But one of the things that brings up though, on a, on a day-to-day level, on a practical level, when you're taking your strategy and putting it on a website, right? And I like your point about the fluff thing, right? Because when we're talking about, again, this B2B perspective, you know, when we, well, let's make it like the, the idea, let's, oh, let's be more creative, right? Creative is wonderful. Creative, we don't want boring copy. We don't want boring messaging. But when I think about it, I think about if I were to write something like stop the smoke before the fire, if that's something that has no context for the person reading it, then it's meaningless because what smoke, what fire, I don't care. Eh. But if I'm writing, I think, that, you know, you said the jobs to be done framework and the technical you know, uh, you, you mentioned earlier the more specific one about escalating, you know, like uh, preventing escalations or something. If I'm 
that you end user audience. And that's something I deal with. And I did work at a contact center years ago. So I remember that was like a stressful thing because if you, if it escalated, it kind of, they ding you for it a little bit. Right. Um, that's something that like might be boring to 99.9% .9 of the population out there, but to the person that's working in a customer service role, that's really interesting, right? Because it actually affects them. So it makes it where it's not about using colorful language by itself. It's about really saying, hey, if what we do is not interesting, inherently interesting to the people that we're serving, that's a bigger problem than that's going to be solved by like a magical copywriting approach, right? And it's a little bit of a, I'm just throwing it out there. I want to see if you had any opinions on that. You're right. It's that lang speaking the language of the customer. I think that's what I'm really lucky to land where I landed because we were already speaking the language of the customer. I'll, you know, I love going on LinkedIn and reading about marketing and talking about folks talking about finding that language and looking back at the work that, that we do at Support Logic and realizing that we talk, we speak that language already. There doesn't, there doesn't have to be this, this change. Um, and then when we go to conferences and we talk to folks, they, they speak that language and we get that kind of feedback loop of, of um, the way folks talk about their pains, the way folks talk about what's important to them is huge. So the language that you use has to line up with how they see their problems. Um, and I think what's, what's really important is, because I know we're talking about pain points, um, and one of my favorite phrases um, that I still think about is, you know, don't, it's like, don't tell me how ugly my baby is. It's like, sometimes I think folks um, hammer the pain points too much instead of talk about the promised land. It's like, yeah, I know I've got these problems. Like, let's show me what's the, oh, all right. <laughs> I know what's not working out. Let's yeah, and, and, and few people want to hear how ugly their baby is or how dumb they are for not having done the right way to do it. Where, however we're framing it. And, and I've certainly been guilty of this plenty of times, right? Cause I could get super snarky in conversations about like what I see as like an outdated practice or whatever, but that's such a great point because like, yes, you need to frame it up. There's a book called unreceptive. Most of what I've learned about marketing, I've really learned from sales books, um, but it's called unreceptive. And it's kind of like, you know, if you, if they're not even receptive to a conversation, it doesn't matter what you're saying. Right. And he, he used the whiteboard analogy and I'm sure it's been used other places, but like what's on their whiteboard, right? If you can, you yeah. know, the whiteboard could be in their head. It could literally be a whiteboard, but if you can match to that, um, and especially in the language, and I think that goes back to the the real reason why having that focus and that clear ICP vision and that clear knowing that you're not going to be able just to go uh, try, the total addressable market is just a starting point. And from there, you really need to narrow it down is because if you're going for this broad potential market, you're going to have a really, really hard time figuring out what that language of the customer is, right? Two, two things that you brought up I thought were really great. Um, the first one is you're right. There's those pain points. There's those things that we got to solve. Um, but there's this idea of sometimes I think folks don't know what the promised land is. And so I love that idea of, and I think this is something Andy Raskin talks about when he talks about strategic narrative, is it's not always bragging or, hey, we have a hot product or a hot toy. It's like, this is the promised land. This is the new dynamic. This is the this is where you need to go. Um, I think that's a huge part of category building, which we're trying to do with support experience. Um, this is where this is where your industry is going. This is what the leaders of the market are doing. Um, I love that perspective too that we talk about of you know the leaders in support and success. This is what they want. Um, they need these insights because they know the value of them. And so we're helping them. We're helping leaders be better. Come along with us. Come along in this new promised land. I love that as an idea, um, as a way to message um, on, a, on a loftier side, on, on kind of the side of, of the folks that are, that are paying for it, of the, of the SVPs. I think that that, that can resonate. Um, and then, as you mentioned, um, with reading sales books, you remind me that when I go to a conference and when I'm talking to people face to face and getting their reaction, you and I are reacting right now. Eye contact is great, but there's something about being 
supremely focused in person and showing someone a product and talking to them and seeing the moments that they want to speak um, and the moments that they light up and and getting their their soul focus away from a Slack alert or their phone or anything, there's something really powerful in that. And so I'm a huge fan of remote work, but I love the in-person of, of showing this stuff off and talking about it. Yeah, I, I think we're all missing that to some extent. It's coming back, but you know, um, having the ability to truly engage in that kind of conversation with people, because it, all the stuff that we're doing, whether it's on a website, messaging, all that stuff, you know, it's the old classic saying, "What's copywriting? It's selling in print or whatever, right?" It's 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 like mm -hmm. we're trying to replicate something that originated in person. That's how it all began. Everything is selling. That's all it is, right? We're just doing it through a different mechanism. And it brings up the importance of getting out of our own heads, getting out of our own little bubbles of what we think is awesome. Because what we think is awesome is really only a starting point. It's good that we're enthusiastic, right? We should be. If we're not enthusiastic about it, uh, the potential of something, then that's not a really good reason to launch a business <laughs> over but that's just a starting point. So having that ability to be face-to-face, -face, like you said, with people in conferences or wherever you're getting to meet them, and then truly being willing to listen. And, and even if what you're hearing is hard to hear, right? Because that's the gems. If you look at any of these success stories, I you know I don't know how many times you've read books where they talk about pivots of YouTube started as this and you know whatever it was. And there are all these huge pivots based on what actually worked and what didn't. Right. And and I wanted to ask you, you know, as we start to wind down, I wanted to ask you, you have this really great culture, obviously, of of leadership that gets it right. And that's a beautiful place to be as a marketer um, there. Not everybody's that lucky. Right. So for people that are listening, they're in a PMM role, they're even a CMO, whatever. And, and you know, they're kind of nodding their head to this conversation, but they're in a situation where they don't necessarily have the influence that they would like to have over these kinds of directions. Um, can you give any advice on, on ways they can approach this so that they could take the idea, take the strategy, take the principles behind this and be able to it, have a little bit more influence over the top level decisions so that they can move it toward these kinds of, uh, you know, first principle thinking of what works in, in product marketing. Building building that coalition for product marketing, uh, building the value that it brings. Um, I think it starts with leadership uh, at the top. And so if I if I had to influence that, I think I would bring in um, as many resources as I can. I think I would try to get everyone on the same page. Um, I think I would bring in... Um, you know, quotes from folks like Andy Raskin and folks who have really, um, you know, spearheaded how important um, strategic narrative is and how important sort of starting at a at a point and starting at a at the um, what's the new uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna not use the right words right now, but what's the new idiom? What's the um, what's the phase shift? What's the direction we all should be facing um, and crafting that for yourself? starting with that narrative and then going down through the pieces. Um, because if you're just changing copy and you're just working on messaging, you're just sort of running the treadmill of, of not really fixing uh, the problem. And so it's, it's, I think it's starting, starting at that first point of, of making sure that everyone is, is looking at this the same way. And, and it's a never ending thing. You know, I, um, I'm learning all the time. I remember when I came in, product market fit was a was a thing I was obsessed with, and and I thought we had it. And leadership here was so good, and and they said, you know, product market fit is something that is constantly changing. When you look at um, the life cycle of a product, which is kind of a classic business school thing, you've got the early adopters, and you've got that that chasm um, that most companies sort of fail in, and then you've eventually got that that hockey stick, that ramp from there. Um, it, I think a lot of folks think that they have product market fit after they have that initial early adopter success. Um, 
But there's an article um, that my CCO just linked to us recently about crossing that chasm. Um, and I'll find it for you and how, how there's so much scale and so much interoperability going on between customer success and sales and product and marketing and you know driving the adoption which in this market that we're in now is even more important than ever um, every sale is scrutinized by the CFO every deal every expansion deal is scrutinized and and capped off and you know churn is happening more than ever and um, quotas aren't getting hit. And so every precious logo or customer that you do get, uh, you've got to hold on to because it's so much more cost to, to acquire the next one. Um, and so really there needs to be an alignment of go to market beyond just new logos, top of funnel, bringing in pipeline. It's about what happens once you have them and expanding on what they're using and building that value and and creating this sort of coalition of customers who are helping in the design phase and making those things better and finding out where your real value is. Because, and I think this is something talked about in the Lean Startup book, but you're always working on that product market fit of who are we for, who are we for? Um, and then as you get more and more aligned with it, then I, I believe that that just happens faster, that folks see who you're for. And you can, with that feedback loop of talking to customers, craft your messaging, continue to work on it, and continue to bring in more of who you're for. I think that's the way forward.